Jacinta Parsons on ABC Radio Melbourne and Victoria. Indeed, indeed. 21 minutes past two o'clock. Very good. Very exciting to have our next guest actually here in the studio. I don't know if you watched Four Corners last night. Louise Milligan investigated homelessness in this country. It's something I heard yesterday that she discussed with Virginia Trioli that she's been interested in for such a long time. The landscape has changed in the way that we understand the, I guess, the demographics of homelessness and the impact and the way we can actually see it now in, uh, or we need to see it in a different way. Emma Dawson, no founder and director of per capita think tank has been um, banging the cage about homelessness for a really long time. She joins us for our economic segment this week on the back of the Productivity Commission report about housing and homelessness. Good afternoon. Hello. It's so nice to be here in person. It's so nice. It's hard to show the excitement I have to see you (laughs) while we're talking about one of the big issues Mm. that this country has faced. For how long would you say we have been in a crisis? Um, Well, the there's no denying we're in crisis now, but the crisis has been building for years, Jacinta, mm. um, and we've been warning, you know, myself, a lot of other policy uh, researchers, academics, specialists in the field, people like Kate Colvin from Everybody's Home, people from Housing for the Aged Action Group, we have been saying for years this is a looming crisis. And I think it's, like with many crises, the shock of COVID and the, how that sort of upended uh, the demographics of the country, people relocating and the housing market has brought it to a head. And what we saw in Louise Milligan's just heart-rending um, Four Corners special last night was the impact of that on people in regional Australia, yeah. in, in parts of the country where you used to be able to afford to rent a decent home, where people now are working full-time and they're living in motels and, and tents because there's just no rental uh, properties available. In or inverted affordable. commas, yeah. the working poor, yeah. which is something that you've spoken about a lot for a long time as well. There's so many issues here that I want to mm. dig in with you. Mm. I want to read Michael of Coburg's text to you immediately because I think the expanse of this issue and the cohorts that it affects for various reasons is really interesting. Michael says that those of us in the homelessness sector are happy to hear discussion on the increasing plight of women over 50, but the forgotten group is actually homeless young people who are almost entirely locked out of the private rental market. Mm. The state government has invested $6.3 billion in affordable and social housing. We need to make, make sure some is directed to young people. Mm. Oh, it, it's one of the issues that uh, we've said it a lot. This should not be an issue. This is a human right to yeah. have a home. Yeah. Where did we go wrong? You, you've been involved in policy um, mm. with, well, on on the left for some time, but you definitely have an overview of both governments and their failures, yeah. really, to yeah. address this issue. Yeah. Where did we Where did we take a wrong foot? Um, it's we we've taken many many wrong turns in relation to the way that we treat housing and property in this country, it, and it's it's not uniquely an Australian problem, but it is an acutely Australian problem. We have um, an attitude to property that is bordering on maniacal in my view. It's all seen as asset building and as wealth building. Um, And at the same time we're seeing this housing crisis emerge, we're learning that Australians are now officially the world's wealthiest people. And that's because of how much money is tied up in our property market, over $10 trillion. How did we get that wrong? What were the policies that led Mm. to that? Because it's actually a reasonable perspective on asset building. We know that this is the way you're handed on to children. It's really the only way sometimes that people can actually find a way forward. Yeah, and I think what you can't blame people for putting no. their money in property. They have been incentivised to do so by our tax system. Um, so, you know, where did we go wrong with this? There's a, there are a lot yeah. of elements that lead to this. We stopped investing in social housing in the in the no, early 1990s. So. What was the reasoning? What, how did we sell that? So the feeling was at the time, as with everything in the kind of, um, you know, economically rationalist agenda that the private sector can deliver things better than the public sector and that has just turned out to be false in so many cases and housing I think is one of them and what governments did was stop building and maintaining and and operating public housing and outsourcing that to the community sector. Now a lot of those community sector social or community housing uh, operators do very good and very important work but governments have stepped back from funding it and, and tried to see a way of 
these things funding themselves, you know, um, of, of market rents creeping up. So rather than in public housing, your rent's capped at 25% in, in community housing, it's 30 or 35%. And there's a call coming from some in the development sector now to allow those tenants to move into the market rents and just have the government subsidise the increase. We put a lot of money, $5.3 billion a year, into Commonwealth rent assistance, which goes to anyone in receipt of income support of any kind. Um, but it's woefully inadequate. It's capped at about $72 a fortnight, which is very little in, in um, today's rental talking, market. What's our average rental? Do you our think? average one-bedroom rental in Melbourne is at least about $450 a week. So one if you're, bedroom yeah, one bedroom rent. rental. So, average. Yeah, so that's you know that's an average. There are there are price properties lower than that, um, but when you look at the rental affordability snapshot that Anglicare puts out every year, there are no properties any longer in Australia that are affordable for someone on job seeker. There are no properties affordable for someone on youth allowance or disability support payment or for working single parents or for single age pensioners. No rental properties are now affordable for them on their own. So we're seeing more and more people living in group homes uh, where they're still in massive rental stress. The Productivity Commission report that came out last week, which was an assessment of the Housing and Homelessness Agreement, found that significant majorities of people in receipt of all government income support are in rental stress, meaning they're paying more than 30% of their income on rent. And around 40% of those on job seeker and youth allowance, the lowest payments, are paying more than 50% of their income mm. on rent. And they found that amongst low-income households across the board, even the so-called working poor, as you say, which is something we thought we'd never have in Australia, are being left with about $250 a week after they've paid their rent. That's right. 50% yeah. of 500 yeah. you know, is yeah. a significant percentage of an income. Yep. What's um, I want to just go back quickly and, and you know, be Stephen Hamilton yeah. or, or wonder how we would think about this. Mm. When we think of that neoliberalist agenda that has, that really took hold in the 90s, yep. under the cloak of a recession too, yes. which is an interesting dynamic that we're seeing again, would there be agreement across the board now that the market has failed in some of these social arenas? Would there be an agreement that social housing is something that needs to be back into government um, control? Yeah, look, I think that agreement is growing. There is a, a widespread view, not just here, but if you look at what's going on in the UK with their cost of living crisis is even worse than ours. Their houses are more affordable, but other things are more expensive. There's a recognition that um, unregulated market activity has gone too far. That, that the market doesn't care about your human rights. Your mark, the market doesn't care about your social well-being or your health. It cares about profit. Um, and that's how the market works. It doesn't trickle down and it doesn't without regulation in Do the public agree, interest. Do we agree largely? I think we largely agree on that. I mean, if you look at the way that the markets responded to the tax cuts for the wealthy in the UK, and it wasn't just about the tax cuts. What a reaction. Yeah. And that was the market saying, this is the wrong thing to do. This is not going to solve the country's economic challenges. It's going to be inflationary. It's it's about it's you know government's borrowing money to put it into the hands of people that already have it that will cause inflation and will do nothing to shore up the economy or to spur productive growth. So there is a recognition that some of these things have gone too far, and that we need to intervene for the interest of people so that the economy works as it's meant to to give us a better life, you know, to give us a good life, and it's failing in that regard. And that the entire community having a better life is a better life for all as well, exactly. which is obviously the agendas are still <laughs> dabbling in a, in a kind of uh, a particular ideology. But if that's what sells the story, then that's mm. also really... Well, there's a lot of evidence for that, JP. You know, um, Thomas Piketty's work has shown that the more unequal a society is, uh, the less, not only less socially stable it is, but the less growth it has, the less economic yeah. benefit... It, it produces and so it actually leads to societal collapse if it goes far enough. Now, you know, housing is the most obvious side of that. If you can't keep a roof over your head in a country where we're told we're the wealthiest people on earth, then that is a failure of the market and a failure of public policy. Okay, so let's go to, uh, it is 2.30, I'm expecting the uh, the rate rise in a moment, we'll get your thoughts on that. But what, um, Emma Dawson joining us, founder and director of Per Capita Think Tank, talking about homelessness, something that you have been begging to have sent into the centre of policy decisions for some time. We're here we're yep. here now. We're yep. deep we cannot in ignore this a crisis. market 
Lead issue. How do we unroll though when we do see that that investment that has been vital to, you know, families and and lineages? How do we change the nature of this situation that we're in? I think the first thing that that needs to happen in any significant change is hap- has already happened, which is the public is woken up to it and yeah. gone. This is not good enough. Interesting. And housing was one of the top issues of people's in people's minds at the last federal election, even though there were some limited policies to address housing affordability but nothing like what was on offer at the at the previous election so public ch- attitudes changing is the first step um and then look we have to acknowledge we are seeing some movement on social housing at both state governments here in, in victoria new south wales queensland um and the new federal got relatively new now federal government have said we are going you know they're lifting investment in public housing but and it's social only housing. a third of what's needed it's a third of what's needed and it's coming off such a low base because we've dropped to the point where social housing is now just 3% of housing stock across the country. It was 6% mm. in the early 1990s. And that's what we're seeing in regional that's towns right. as well. It's down to one That's down point to one something. percent and that there's just no social housing available, which puts pressure on the lower end of the rental market. A lot of these things took off when we introduced uh, the capital gains tax discount, when that was introduced in the late 1990s, around 99, 2000. That's when we saw property prices start to take off much, much faster than wages because there was a, a quick tax benefit of profit to be made from from investing and holding properties and flipping them in seven years and getting that, that gain without paying the same amount of tax on it. In my view, and Stephen Hamilton used to agree with me on this, it's the capital gains tax discount rather than negative gearing that has driven that unaffordability to buy a home. But what we're seeing now and economists told me for many years, oh, well, rents are fine, rents are stable, you know, rents are the real cost of living, and they're not. We've seen rents go up across the country over the last two years by between 15 and 30%, and in some regional towns it's 40%, and it's just not affordable for people. So we do have a situation now where it can't be fixed by government alone, and actually I'm releasing a report tomorrow, it's been commissioned by Australians Investing in Women, and it takes a, a gender lens to the housing crisis, um, and and much like the, the, the text before, yes, young people, um, particularly those relying on, on uh, youth allowance, are very, very vulnerable. But the, the gender lens shows that it's, again, older women over 55, single mothers, and particularly women and children escaping family violence. That is the leading cause of homelessness in this country. And 9,000 women and their children are being made homeless because of that every year. And another 7,000, and this was research done by my friend Angela Jackson at Equity Economics, another 7,000 are returning to violent partners because there's nowhere to go. I am devastated when we talk about this stuff. Um, this is my little editorial, yeah. <laughs> which I need to keep in my bag. But I think this is just, it's a human rights issue. Yeah. This isn't about politics. No. This is about the state of our community. We've got calls coming through so many uh, texts as well on this issue. But I will let you know that the Reserve Bank, do you want to have a guess? Do you want to play the game where you guess what they've done? They've gone up another half. No, guess what? what? They've slowed it. A little bit, ah, just and a this is the sixth yep. hike, yep. but we're looking at a 0.25 okay. percent point. Everyone was expecting the 0.5, yep. Yep. but they've slowed it somewhat. I don't know what difference that will make. What's your so the cash rate has been lifted now to 2.6, yes, and it's been lifted very rapidly. Um, you know, as you said, six rises in six months. Um, I'm <laughs> The first thing to say is the Reserve Bank doesn't have many other tools. They don't. They really don't. They can. They can raise interest rates to try and reduce inflation. Um, but I tend to agree with um, Robert Reich, for example, in the US, and other economists here, Alan Kohler, who uh, speaks on the ABC about these issues, um, Ross Gittins, Michael Pasco, who have said none of whom are you know necessarily trained economists, but they get this stuff. This isn't necessarily going to reduce inflation. Infl- the inflation in this case is not being caused by households. In Debted households spending too much or having wage increases. Actually, there's a big problem with companies having too much price control and being able to raise their prices more than they need to because of the concentration of the market. So that's probably a conversation for another day. But in terms of this issue, it's going to cause oh. a lot of housing stress for people with mortgages. So if you've got an average, the average more average new mortgage now is over six hundred thousand mm. dollars. So you're looking at over the last six months an additional. 1200 a month for a family um, 
that's buying a home and that has just entered the market, that is crippling. And you will, we will start to see some people living in negative equity where they owe more on their house than their house is worth or even uh, under such mortgage stress that they start to default on their mortgages and that will again put them back into that very, very crowded rental market. Deep breathing, everybody. Deep breathing. Um, I feel like we'll find a solution, Emma. one 777 We are going to be speaking antiques in a moment, but we're very lucky to have Emma Dawson join us from Per Capita Think Tank, releasing a report into homelessness tomorrow as well yeah. through your world. John of Thornbury has been uh, very patient on the line. Good afternoon, John. Oh, good afternoon. <coughs> Oh, John, you had I'm about 20 minutes to cough <laughs> and now you've just done it while you're on air. That might, might be nervousness. Oh, um, gotcha. Um, the solution is simple, but it requires political and social courage to look at our society as a, an holistic being where no part can be kept separate from any other part. And the social dividend from... from provide proper, stable, low-income housing for people who need it is that it will not cost us billions of dollars further down the track in mental health, physical health, crime issues, drug issues, and all those depressing things that are uh, uh, spiralling out of control at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. But this it takes is... political courage and the community to stop think, thinking selfishly about itself. Well, even if we start politi- thinking selfishly, John, maybe we are thinking about ensuring that everybody is uh, mm. doing well because, as you say, there's a social dividend in, in that. Thank you very much for holding on this afternoon. Uh, we've got Peter in Glen Rowan, uh, Emma, reacting to the Reserve Bank. Hello, Hello Peter. How are you going? Yeah, good. How are you? Well, I'm good. My beef with all of this is the federal government and the Reserve Bank governor knew the writing was on the wall. You only had to look at what was happening in Europe, America, New Zealand, and they held off putting up interest rates. And they so their monetary policy was delayed, and their fiscal policy. The government's still giving 100% write-off for cars, for tractors, for machinery, for fencing, all those sorts of things. So inflation isn't just about monetary policy, it's about adjusting fiscal policy. And I am an economist, and and I don't understand why they keep delaying this. They need to put the brakes on monetary and fiscally. They can't just do one in isolation. So I don't get why we aren't talking about that. Emma, what do you reckon? You're spot on. I mean, if you look at what just happened in the UK, the markets reacted the way they did because um, the Bank of England is trying to, you know, curb inflation by increasing interest rates and here came the government with this massive stimulatory package of tax cuts and and funding uh, for the community. Um, And our Treasurer was making this point on the weekend, you know, that there's a lesson in that about having monetary and fiscal policies pulling in opposite directions, which they have been now for some time time here um, and so we do need the government to get to, to get serious fiscally and I think one of the big challenges there is not going ahead with these stage three tax cuts um, making sure that they are if not abandoned then significantly reformed to ensure that they're not only not inflationary but also not so incredibly unfair thanks Peter really excellent to hear from you so much pressure on stage three it'll be fascinating to mm-hmm. see how they do respond that. Uh, Kate's in Mentone. Don't have a huge amount of time, but love to hear what you have to say, Kate. Um, Well, uh, you were talking about, like, getting people into the housing market. The only way I was able to get a house with my partner was the recent Victorian Home Buyers Fund scheme that they have. Um, So it's not first home owners, so it doesn't matter if you meet another partner um, you can still get a house, but um, the government has equity in your house. So we went with it with the knowledge that, well, we could see that the prices were going insane, that the prices were going to, get to go down. But then it's like, well, then there's the benefit of buying the, the government out. But they're not going to lose money. They're holding 25% equity on your property, and then when you sell it, they'll get the money out. So it's like a, a win-win. They're holding the money, but someone's got a house. So I yeah. think that's the way we've got to go forward with. 
Kate, yeah. great but point. Every- Emma, what's your perspective yeah. on that shared policy? E- shared equity is a much, much better solution than first home buyer grants. First home buyer grants are inflationary and they push up the cost of housing and the Productivity Commission made that clear last week. Some of the ideas that are in the report that I've done for Australians Investing in Women tomorrow include expanding shared equity beyond just government schemes so that the private sector, so that private investors can take a stake in someone's home rather than buy a holiday house, um, encouraging more build-to-rent properties so that people have stable, long-term, secure rental like they get in Europe um, and in, and uh, creating the, the financial framework so that uh, we can have more innovative solutions like cooperative housing, villages where single people can come and live together and own a stake in their own home without such high upfront costs. So there are innovative private sector solutions here too, but that requires people who are at the pointy end of the profit making of property to say maybe we're going to make a little bit less profit and have a better society with all of those social dividends that you talked about before. Really quickly because we have um, our next guest Rowan Solich uh, joining us to talk antiques. Meg's in Castlemaine. Meg, really quickly, what have you got to say? I was just going to say, look, as, as a, I own property that I rent out. I rent it out fairly cheaply. Um, I always um, with the real estate, they push, push, push for you to put the rent up which we don't do because we've got a long-term rent. And on my other one, which is a rural rental and a private one, um, the person's been there a long time. I consider it their home and their rent is a really low rent. Oh, um, good on you, I, put up. I believe that the policy is wrong because even the government... Um, asks you why you're not getting extra rent, why you're not making That's more money from the property. Meg, there, there should be incentives actual, for you and people like you to be really thinking about how they're renting up properties. Absolutely, and I, I applaud you, Meg, because it is someone's home that you're renting to them, and you know, you've got the security of that investment over time. You will maintain the equity, but you're renting it to somebody at a rate they can afford. We should have better incentives in our system to allow that, rather than the opposite, which Meg's right. At the moment, Moment, people are pushed to make the maximum they can from someone else's home. I, it's an awful thing to say, but I've enjoyed this conversation so much. It's such an important conversation. I really appreciate the work that you've done in this space for a really long time, Emma Dawson. Let's have you back. We'll see if we can get a sparring partner. Yep, um, we're, we're looking for one, but we are looking for one. But in the meantime, it's a delight to stretch <laughs> out in the paddock and talk uh, business with you. Emma Dawson here, founder, director at Per Capita Think Tank. Thank you so much for joining us.